organization. They signify a resort to policing and blockading in the face of this ungovernability. Third thesis. Insofar as the new walls at the edges of nation states articulate with other barriers and other forms of surveillance, private and public, they signal a corrupted divide between internal and external policing and militarization, and indeed a corrupted divide between the police and the military. This in turn suggests an increasingly blurred distinction between the inside and outside of nations themselves, and not only between criminals within and enemies without. Indeed, one irony of late modern walling is that a structure which is often taken to signify and enforce an inside-outside distinction, a boundary between us and them, between friend and enemy, appears as precisely the opposite when it is grasped as part of a complex of eroding lines between police and military, subject and patria, vigilante and state, law and lawlessness. Fourth thesis. In their response to contested and eroding state sovereignty, the new walls project an image of sovereign jurisdictional power and an aura of the bounded and secure nation that is at the same time undercut, undone by the very existence of the walls. Notwithstanding their strikingly physicalist and obdurate dimensions, the new walls often function theatrically. They project power and efficaciousness that they do not and cannot actually exercise, and which they also performatively contradict. To literalize walls as pure interdiction occludes their production of an imago of sovereign state power in the face of its undoing. It occludes the wall's consecration of the very corruption, contestation, and violation of the borders that they would fortify. So to, so to treat walls as pure interdiction, as doing what they appear to do, as functioning to actually blockade and secure, misses the way they stage sovereign powers of protection that are radically limited by modern technologies and paths of infiltration, and also powers that are radically limited by the dependence of various national economies on much of what the walls purport to lock out, especially cheap labor. It misses, in short, the Wizard of Oz quality in the new walls, the way that they echo coded security threat levels that stage an image of state intelligence, an image of state, of state control in the face of the opposite. Fifth thesis. This theatricalized and spectacularized performance of sovereign power at the aspirational or actual national borders brings into relief nation-state sovereignties theological remainder. If walls do not actually accomplish the interdiction that fuels and legitimates them, if they perversely institutionalize the contested and degraded status of the boundaries they limb, they nevertheless stage both sovereign jurisdiction and an aura of sovereign power and awe. So walls bear the irony of being mute, material, and prosaic, yet potentially generative of theological awe, largely unrelated to their quotidian functions or failures. Sixth thesis. The striking popular desire for walling today, considered in light especially of recent pejorative histo historical associations with walling, the Berlin Wall, for example, and also considered in light of contemporary walling's general inefficacy vis-a-vis -vis its putative aims, the fact that most walls simply don't work to do what they are putatively meant to do, this striking popular desire for walling can be traced to an identification with an anxiety about sovereign impotence. The popular desire for walling harbors a wish for the powers of protection, containment, and integration of identity promised by sovereignty. And here again, we're in religious territory. The fiction of nation-state sovereignty carries over from God what <coughs> Freud identified as a fantasy generated from the perspective of infantile helplessness, of parental omnipotence and protection, a fantasy that generates, according to Freud, the very idea of the divine. Put, put in a very compressed fashion, the fiction of state sovereignty is a secularization of this fiction of divine power and the deteriorating via, via, viability of such political fictions 
generates understandable human anxiety, one that is addressed in part by the theological effect and affect of walling. Seventh and final thesis. The detachment of sovereign powers from nation states threatens not only the sovereignty and security of subjects, but an individual and national imaginary that depends upon horizon and containment. Walls offer what Heidegger termed a reassuring world picture in a time increasingly <coughs> absent, increasingly absent the horizons, the containment, and the security and protection that humans have historically required for social, psychic, and political integration. Now you note that none of these theses dwell on the frequently devastating effects of the new walls on the communities, livelihoods, and ecologies that they traverse. These effects include lost lives, lost family members, orchards, incomes, hopes, political futures. They include divided communities and often devastated ecosystems. Reckoning this damage is important, but it's different from understanding the relationship of these new walls to crumbling nation state sovereignty. So the project that I'm engaged in is not for or against walls as such. It's not analyzing or proposing border policies. Rather, what I'm trying to do is reveal certain contemporary political predicaments of power, especially the predicaments of state sovereignty through the phenomenon of walling. Okay, so now I'll just elaborate a little bit of, of, of these theses um, through some more concrete material um, in, in the second half of, of this talk. Let me start with the, the problem of sovereign failure, or what I'm calling walls as an icon of the erosion or failure of state sovereignty. As I've already suggested at first blush, what's really striking about the walls proliferating at the dawn of the 21st century is their seemingly physical or obdurate pre-modern signature in the context of a late modern world in which power is increasingly networked, virtual, microphysical, even liquid, and in which peoples are increasingly linked, if not hybridized. However accustomed we've all grown to checkpointed passageways striating everyday life at the entrances of museums and concerts and sports events and schools and airports and auditoriums, there's a markedly archaic quality to the slow manifest construction of walls fashioned from concrete, from brick, from iron, from steel, from barbed wire, or even synthetic mesh. Compared to the evanescent, protean, depthless, and facade traits of late modern culture and politics, walls seem solid and permanent. They appear absent capacities for guile and dissimulation as well. Now the nomenclature, of course, often aims to dissimulate. We have, for example, the Israeli security fence, or the U.S. border marker, or Northern Irish peace lines. But such nomenclature is often openly mocked by the unmaskable characteristics of the referent, and also by the protest murals and graffiti that often adorn that referent. And these are just a few examples. Um, these are all the Israeli wall. And then these are the U.S.-Mexico wall. And there's actually a traffic between the protest mural um, graffiti artists between the two walls, just as there's a traffic between the subcontractors between the two walls. These coffins um, are updated each month and they mark the deaths that have occurred in the desert as a result of the walls that simply push migration eastward and into more harrowing conditions. And so each month a new coffin is put up with a new set of numbers of the, of the um, migrants who have, who have traveled through the desert and not made the crossing. And then, of course, the walls in Northern Ireland are famous. Um, this is actually just a, a, a gra graffiti on one of those walls as opposed to the actual murals that are drawn there. <laughs> 